to you. Every individual has about 10% of themselves, 10 to 15, the normal people, that is to say, of themselves that they never open to anyone, not even their mate, their children, their mother, their father. It's that hidden part that we all have. As a matter of fact, if you go on and that unknown part or that hidden part grows to, say, 20 to 25 percent, you have a person that has problems. They can be very, they can develop complexes, certainly inferior. And many times this is something that happened, something that happened even when the person was a child that formulated this particular ratio. But I want to talk to that 10%, 15% that is you that is just normal because it is within that that your soul rests. Your soul, you. We're about to approach a time when the Lord needs some very stable-minded people. People that do not doubt. People that do not wave up. So not only must you be trained, but that inner you, your soul, must realize the teachings of Christ. And there's only one way you can strengthen that you can strengthen that self, that part of you, and that is in faith. Isn't that a simple old message? But I'm talking to you, that inner part. We're not just playing church. I'm talking about that part that you've never shared with anyone. But he knows that part, and he loves that part also. And it is that part that can really get you in trouble. It's that little part that if you were to have more than 10 or 15 percent, you would be one of these people that would say, well, my grandparents were always strong church people. You know, kind of the, you might say, the stock of the community, all right? And they did it, and it was right, and it was noble, and I mean, after all, didn't everybody in the community respect them because they went to church, you know? That, and I want to pray to God, but in that 10%, sometimes that little thing called doubt pops out. Well, I know they did it. Is it really real? I heard a lecture on evolution the other day. <sighs> that speaker, he was really quite a speaker. My high school teacher told me about evolution. It's in the books. It's there. Is, is the pastor and myself right? Is it correct? When we read the scriptures, I mean, that's not like the whole school system, you know? That's not like the whole world that follows after this same teaching, that is to say, of evolution, humanism. Well, no, I, I know I give my heart to God and my love to God, and I've got faith, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to pray anyway, whether it works or not. Mm -mm, come on, come on. It is too late in this generation to be in that frame of mind too late. You've got to know. Therefore, tonight we cover the first teachings of Christ after the resurrection. I hope, dear one, that when I discuss and talk this over with that part of you that you've never shared with anyone else, as you take that part within that part of yourself, that you listen to these proofs that are so simple. And I assure you that the proofs of his second advent are even simpler than that. There is a day coming when you're going to be delivered up before Antichrist if you remain true. And he's going to look you in the eye with his big beautiful eyes and he's going to say, don't you know I love you? Your mother, your father, your brother, they want you to listen to me. I don't want to hurt you. I just want your soul. I want your faith on me. There can be no waiver at that moment, dear one. You've got to know what the scripture says concerning this, and you cannot have that doubt factor. He's real. We're not playing church. Christianity is a reality. So that's why I'm... Did you get the phone? 
I thought the Lord was calling us there for a minute. You know, this is rolling off so good here, and we're getting started, you know. All right. Uh, but let that part of you that you keep so covered and smothered that you don't dare let anyone else see or feel or touch, open it up a little bit tonight and listen to the Word of God and know that you don't have anything to be ashamed of and that you can be totally open. Now, that, don't misunderstand me in saying that. You're always going to have that 10%. I am or what. But what I want you to do, I want you to square that 10% square in the face and be honest with it. Tell it it's going to do exactly what you and your soul decree that it shall. And you want it to come on and fess up too and make sure that in those hidden parameters of your mind, your soul, your body, that there's no room for doubt. That you're a can-do type Christian, and you don't ask any favors but to love the Lord and to know that his scripture is true. Now, why did I choose this takeoff? Well, this is such a simple message. But, beloved, it is the simple thing sometimes that we get careless with. It really is. And we're coming into a time that you're going to find that these simple things are probably more important than ever. And your honesty with yourself and with him is priceless. Just absolutely priceless in this mixed up, confused world. Let's start the story. You can open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24 if you like. Christ has just come from the tomb. Mary Magdalena has talked with him. He's been, he's been to the Father. He returned to two of the disciples walking down a road. These disciples walking down the road, the truth in the Greek was holding from them. And I'm going to tell you why the truth was holding from them. You'll find that verse... In um, 13, verse 13 of that 24th chapter, they were going down to get a hot bath. Remember, we just covered this on television. We'll go down and grab a quick hot tub, all right? Christ had died. They followed his footsteps. They believed on him. But now that he's gone, they're going after a hot bath. It doesn't seem that they're even thinking about the things that he taught them. Well, maybe it wasn't true. Maybe this was all a dream. Maybe it was terrible on that cross seeing him there. It was terrible and frightening when they drove us away. Let's just stop and let's just think a moment. Let's, let's go down. Let's go. Let's go. It's only seven miles. Let's run over to, to um, Emmaus uh, hot baths. Let's, let's run over there and relax a little bit. After all, we're really uptight and they're walking down that road and to them a stranger joins them beloved I do not believe those disciples had it not been withholding from them they were blinded for you today for your benefit so that you can see how it happens when you in the, when you are in the stark reality of the crucifixion or the fulfillment of prophecy as it comes to pass, even though it is embedded in your mind, preached, te taught, and embedded and imbued there. And it's still real easy to say, whew, it's all over. I'm not sure. I wonder. I really wonder. Beloved, always do not Put your strength in God's Word in man. Put it in that Word. You let that 10% of you open up and pour out into that Word. I don't care what happens to any man at any time. The Word stays the same. You understand that? The Word stays the same. It will come to pass as it's written. So he buddies right up. The Lord buddies up with these two. And he said, did you hear what happened? They say to the Lord, well, what? Tell me about it, he said. He said, well, the Lord was crucified. 
We don't know where the rest are as they walked along, and you can see all parts of doubt, but bear in mind, God placed this there. And let's pick it up in verse 24. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said. They kind of doubted the women, but yep, yep, it was just like they said, but him they saw not. Didn't see him. Didn't see the Lord. That's doubt. Just slips in all over you. I don't care what the world does, and I don't care what you hear, I don't care what you read. God's plan shall come to pass exactly as it's written. What, what I'm trying to, I really want to strike home is I want you to be prepared mentally to observe the supernatural in action and not let it weaken or phase your faith. You know the false supernatural one comes first, and you must even have that 10% of you that can take over at a time like this, you may just want to go get a hot bath, all right, or whatever. But I heard the report, but the Lord wasn't there. He wasn't there. All that he had taught them, he told them exactly where he would be. Had they concentrated on the scripture, it was written, it was there all the time. And that's why you must embed that 10% of yourself in that scripture, get your teeth on it and hang on to it and say, this, it's going to happen this way and I'm going to see it come to pass. And no one will waver my mind or thought in any direction. It shall happen as it is written. you got to get tough with yourself sometimes because self can be a little bit weak. If you let it, you got to hold the line. Jesus answered then in verse 25 when this doubt was obvious. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What is it that they were slow to believe? The scripture, the word. Do you believe it? Oh, yes, yes, I believe the word. Does that 10% of you believe the word? Or do sometimes you say, well, I... I want to pray for a moment, but I just don't know. I don't, I, but I'll do it anyway, you know. That's not honest. It's not honest at all. He loves you so much it breaks his heart when you think something like that. I didn't say say it. When you even think something like that, it breaks his heart. He died for you. And you would doubt him. And some of the minor, the mildest things to say, well, he'd die for me, but he wouldn't hear my little old prayer. He hears you. He loves you. He talks with you. Even that 10%. Don't ever doubt him. So he, I think that he accomplished and blinded these poor people so that you can see what could happen to you in this generation if you allow it when, you're, when you see others delivered up. Boy, it should be awful easy not to get involved in that situation. Well, I'm going to just wait a little while. You do that. You listen to the Holy Spirit. He's in control, and he'll tell you exactly what to do. But don't let there be any doubt. You stand for your people. There's a lot riding on you. God's counting on you, just like he counted on Job. How slow they are to believe the prophets. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to have entered into his glory? In other words, the very scriptures stipulate these two guys walking down the road, he's going to die on the cross and through that destroy sin. It's throughout the prophets. It's throughout the scriptures. He didn't, he should not have to, he should not have even had to have told them that's exactly what would happen had they understood the scripture. Let's go one more verse. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Do you know what Moses is? That's the Pentateuch. That's Genesis. He's just out of the tomb, and this is his first teaching. 
It's a very, very important teaching to you today. And my dear friends, I am convinced in my heart that it was done for your benefit. Those men walked with him for three years. You know they would have recognized him had God not blinded them. See that you don't fail to recognize the true Christ simply because it might be, it might look a little more risky or a little more excitement than maybe the old ticker could handle. Have faith and step out there, and I guarantee you, he'll rock in your foundation. And you, as one, will put a thousand to flight. We're coming up into some beautiful, wonderful times. No doubters allowed, dear one. No doubters allowed. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry about it. You know, that was one thing about the old United States Marine Corps. When I don't care how tough it got, unless he was killed, that old boy beside you was going to be there. He wasn't going to run. He wasn't going to leave you there by yourself. Discipline. In this case, spiritually speaking, discipline and faith both. What a fool it would be that would run in the face of the chance, the opportunity to serve the living God, to know and to understand. So he sat right down and he gave them a little old Bible lesson that's the simplest little old thing to kind of say, don't you know? It's there all the time. Don't play church with me, you, you fools, is what he called them, you dullards in the Greek. Don't play games with me. It was written thousands of years ago, and now it's happened. So what? Where was your faith? Why did you doubt? And I say to you tonight, if it came to pass then, there's no difference in what's coming. As it's written, it's going to happen exactly that way. You don't have to have any doubt. Isn't that precious? Think about it. Think about it. You don't have to doubt. You can count on it. I don't know if you realize it or not, but you're looking at a miracle right now when you look around at these, just like you, just like you. Maybe you weren't such a red-hot church goer ever. Maybe you didn't ever have your mind really seated in the flyaway Betty by stuff. You really weren't just that good of a Christian according to their measurements. But God does not want their measurements. He wants this measurement. And here he has pulled us all together for a precious opportunity, the fulfillment of prophecy itself, that his word go forward. So don't you cop out on me and say that's too simple. This is the first teaching that your Savior did when he came from the tomb, and it starts with Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. He said, didn't you read it? Let's do it. Let's read it. Genesis 3, verse 14 and 15. This is that book of Moses, the Pentateuch. What does it say there in verse 14? And do you know something? As it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. We're still dealing with the same old critter, the serpent, all right? Same old critter. God doesn't change or pull too many surprises on you, friend. It's all the same. And that's the kind of st word study and belief that you can put your faith in. All right, what does it say? And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. In other words, do you see where doubt could get you? If it got you in that camp, my God, what have you got to look forward to? Other than dust, smut, filth, lies, perversion. How disgusting to even think you could let doubt for a Savior that would die for you enter into your mind as such filth as this serpent, uh, this devil. 15, and I will put enmity. Now, did God say, maybe I'm going to get around? No, he said, I will put 
enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. I swear to God, I think one reason we see such strong women soldiers in this end time is because of this. It's get even day. I tell you the truth about it. I've seen women that will stand with a spirit that would Satan would run from. It's get even time for the ladies, I'll tell you. I, I believe it. I really do. And the women between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy uh, head. In other words, he's going to bust your noggin. What's in your noggin? The brain. He's going to kill you. That's what it means. And thou shalt bruise his heel. Jesus said, there it was written. All the way back in Genesis, they're going to nail my heels to the cross. It was there all the time. How could, how could you not have faith? You, you stood there, you observed the crucifixion. You saw his hands nailed and then his feet. And there was this verse in God's word. God said, I will. And he did. What does that mean to you today? That same serpent is returning as the dragon. And do you know something? He will. Don't you only let Ten little old percent of yourself grab a hold of that. All of you, totally complete, and know that God's word is complete as it's written. And bless your hearts, it's here all the time. What you're hearing is Jesus' first teaching after the resurrection. It's important, though it is simple, because the wisdom that is buried into it will strengthen your faith just as much as any of the rest of his teachings. This was the last one, basically, in simplicity. And then you could return right, well, let's just take it right through the Old Testament. Let's, let's go, let's stay in Genesis, but let's go to chapter 22. Oh, this is so beautiful, but so simple. Can you imagine him taking the time to teach these scriptures to these boys that didn't even recognize him? He did it to show you how important it was. 22:15, and it reads, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn. In other words, you can count on it. There's none greater than God to swear by, saith the Lord. For because thou hast done this thing and has not withheld thy nations, the father of Israel as well as all ethnic nations, and the seed that would come from the loins of Abraham would be that Messiah, the true Messiah, not the fake. The true Messiah that would speak to those two lonely, blinded men walking down the road that day. I want you to see those two men, and I want you to see them real good, because by the grace of God, there might go you. Good English, right? But it made the point. Don't let yourself be caught in that position, dear one. It is written. That seed that would bless the, every race, every color, every creed, that would believe, that would take hope, that would obey, that would even try. You know, that's a beautiful thing, is that when we stumble, bum, and bless your hearts, you know, there's nobody that's a, I'll, I'll even set and use myself as an example. You know, when I was, when I was, 13 or 14, I was already six foot two, and there I had them other little old kids in my class, you know, and I could stumble, and it seemed like I really got a complex that everything I did just, then nobody could mess things up like I could or displease my grandpa. He's the one that raised me. There's nobody could displease him more than I could, but how that man loved me. And he counted it as good, you know. Well, so does our father. He counts, even though we trip and even though we slide. Hey, if he can bless somebody like me with you, you know, you're precious, then what will he do for you, all right? When you really believe him, when you really follow him for your people, even for this world. And let me tell you something. We, I, I'm not at liberty to discuss it, but we're having a far greater impact on this nation than you might think we are. You might be surprised on the rolls is like a who's who, even in certain ministries of this nation and the world that study right with us. 
I will not, dis I will not um, give way to mentioning names or anything of that nature, but I just want you to know that even in the White House of this great nation, this program has been observed and adhered to for quite some time, and it makes a difference. What makes it make a difference? Because the Word is taught there. So don't you think that you're not in a time, living in a time, that God's Word is important if you stick to that Word and give it credit. Believe it and have faith in it. God can never finish blessing you. So he told this to Abraham. What had Abraham just done? Remember that Mount Moriah? Moriah took Isaac up there. The Lord, he was too old to sire a child. Sarah was too old. There was, there's no hope. And a miracle baby happened. And then God says, take him up there and kill him. Abraham had the faith to know if God said it, it was all right. Now, that's difficult for some to understand, but know this. Abraham knew that God evidently was setting this child up as Savior, and he knew that the serpent must bruise his heel. All right? that if the knife came down that God would simply raise him, he knew that Isaac was coming back down off that mountain with him, but he didn't know as a saint or Messiah or what, but he trusted the Lord. Hey, we're talking about a heavy thing there when you take your own child's life, dear ones. That's a heavy trip, all right? Abraham did that. He did not withhold and receive the blessing. So do you see how, it is, how important it is that you have faith? Do you want me to tell you on the other hand how, how God dislikes the faithless? Especially if you want to believe, but you just let that little old 10% walk in. Do you understand why I'm talking to that 10% tonight? It's late. Let's go on. Let's go to Numbers 21. Abraham did not withhold the son. God withheld that son because it would be his own son that would die on that cross, that would be Messiah. Okay, Numbers chapter 21. Let's pick it up with verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee, praying to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Remember, this was the time they were in the wilderness here. I want you to make a mental note of this. You'll be remembering it again tomorrow afternoon. They were in that wilderness, and strange things can happen in the wilderness, all right? They sinned to the point that God sent some snakes in there. The snakes bit them, and they died. But there's a real deep message in this. Listen to it. And Moses prayed for the people. Always pray for your people when you see your brothers and sisters that are unbelievers. Pray for them. They're your own. But by the grace of God, there would sit you. Good English, but it gets the message. Eight, and the Lord said unto Moses, Take, make thee a fiery serpent. What's he got? Lord's telling them to make a serpent. Yep. And set it upon a pole. This is symbolic of the crucifixion of Christ on the pole. of all the sin, ours even tomorrow, that were placed on that cross that he paid the price for. So yes, even this scripture speaks of Christ on that cross. I hope that this strengthens the simplicity of this message, strengthens your faith to the point that when you begin to look forward to what tomorrow brings. And how blessed you are that you would live in this generation when you can hardly keep up with the prophecies that are being fulfilled each day, then your conscience should say to you, something's about to happen. Am I ready? Am I ready for what? Maybe we should oversimplify it, and I'm not talking down to you. Are you ready for what? To do what pleases him. He's calling out some very special people in this generation. Some people that can plow deep spiritually. That's why I said I see a, 
I see a movement even among women that their spirits seem to want to fight back at that serpent because this is a spiritual war that we're about to enter into. It is not the power of the arm that shall prevail in this battle, but of the Spirit, your faith, your strength in Him, because He is our strength. That's what you've got to be ready for. Do you know the Scripture? Well, I wish I knew all of it. Lord, I do too, dear one. That's not possible that any of us can know all the Scripture. But work at it. Do work at it. All right? He can't learn the general overall plan and stick with it. All right? Absorb it. Okay. Uh, so we see another type there of Messiah. Let's go on to Psalm 16. I'm not going to keep you real long tonight. There is no need to. I want to talk to that 10% of you that no one else ever speaks to. And I want to shake it a little bit. I want to wake it up to the fact that I don't want it to deceive you. I don't want you to allow it to leave you astray, especially in this generation. This is what Jesus told those men after the resurrection, after the crucifixion. Verse 16, chapter 16 in the psalm, that 16th psalm, and we want to pick it up with about verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Can you say that? Let's all say it. I shall not be moved. Right? Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. In hope, in peace, in tranquility. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Christ went to that place of holding called paradise, and he freed a bunch of them. But he didn't stay there. He won't yours either. We have the victory. You understand where this is coming from now? This is Jesus telling those men, did you think I was going to stay in hell? Haven't you read the scripture? Didn't you read that 16th Psalm? He wasn't going to keep me there. I'm coming back. And beloved, he's coming back again. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Though I be on that cross, that pole, and bear the entire sins of the world for one and all times, I won't be corrupted. Isn't that beautiful? And when you're in him and he's in you, though we do fall short, we have that hope and that, protect, that perfection within ourselves. It'll pick you right up by the bootstraps. It'll strengthen you. And when you get one of these little old problems in this world that, I mean, dadgum, it just looks like the whole sky's falling in on you. Hey, we can handle it. It's no problem, no trouble, friend. Our Lord is in control. We've got a great advantage, a great, great advantage if you will understand the simplicity and let it talk to that 10% of you that you've never let anyone else just really get real close to and talk to, and know, and know that he loves you, that he wants to help you. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. That's your lot. You got a choice. Do you want the dust? You want your belly to drag around on the ground right with your leader? If you follow the serpent, don't let that little old 10% of yourself get hope to you. You say, I've got enough sense that it doesn't take a real bright person to say, I'm not following that sucker. I want no part of him. So don't you even try to gnaw at me and cause my faith to let doubt slip in. After all, I am a child of God, the living God, and within him I have my strength. All right? That's real easy. Practice doing that, saying it to yourself. You talk to that inside self. Hey, friend, I've been in this old body quite a while, and I know what it'll do to you. I know how it'll talk to you. You're not talking to, you know, just anybody here. I know how that little old 
10% can get hold of you and say, oh, now, shoot, let's think about this a minute. Whoops, watch it. If you stop and listen to it, you already have. Okay? You get tough with it. You get real tough with it. Because, beloved, the sad truth is this, or I call it the good truth. There's time we got to cast the 10% out if it becomes necessary and fill it with, with the fire of the living God and become ministers of fire rather than play actors, playing Christian, playing I want to know God's Word. There's nothing that complicated about God's Word. The simple facts are stated. These men seem to have forgotten them, and Jesus is teaching them right out of the, right out of the tomb. That was the most important thing at that moment to him. And again, I think it was for you. It's beautiful that he would take that time after having paid that price to come back for you. I think I can better understand in understanding this how he would say when he was carrying that cross up the hill, daughters, don't weep for me, but weep for yourself. The day shall come when it will be said, Blessed are those that are barren. That is, those that do not wed the false one, that stay virgins for me. In that spiritual sense, it is so precious to him. When out of the dark night, of mid, we got, what, five, five billion people living today, five billion souls down there. And all of a sudden, as we look up at the stars and see one flash and flicker, he looks down and he sees you when you say, Lord, I love you. I want to do right. I want you to use me, Lord. He starts applauding. He reaches out and he embraces you spiritually. And he gives you things that you cannot imagine. Power, understanding, depth, perseverance, faith. He'll see that nothing happens to that faith. He's real. He sees you. He sees your light when it flickers. And when you say, Lord, help me today, he likes to help you. Do you, know, you don't, don't think you're bothering him. Don't think you're bothering him when you've got a problem and say, Lord, I need to talk to you a minute. He's big enough, all right, for all of us, all five billion. Say, yeah, i got time. What's your problem? Well, Lord, my dishwasher went on the kaput. <laughs> I don't know what to do. He probably said, well, turn it off, put a plug in the sink, and pour the oxydol in there and wash them. Okay, you know? Find the way. I'm sorry. Does that sound feminist when I said that? or anti I'm sorry. Okay. No, but what I'm saying is he'll give us a way out. It may not be the way always we want, but he will always give us that way out. Okay. I don't want to cover Psalms 22 today because, you know, that's Passover. And you know what I was trying to tell you this morning is Passover is always April the 3rd or uh, 2nd or 3rd. Always. Always. That's that Sabbath, all right? We're going to talk about that tomorrow just a little bit more. There's, we could go on and on with the prophecy that stated he would die on that cross for us. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. Let's, he, he mentioned the prophets. Let's go to verse 7 first. We'll just spend one or two, and then I'm going to close this and allow some questions here in a little bit. Chapter 7, the book of Isaiah, verses 10 through 14. <clears throat> and verse 10 reads, Moreover the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either out of depth, the depth, or in the height above. And Ahaz said, I will not ask, and neither, neither will I tempt the Lord. You want to remember, if your faith is strong enough that you don't even have to ask for a sign, that's pretty st strong, my friends. It's really pretty strong. A lot of people say, well, I wish God would show me a sign. Do you really want to? Your faith, your faith is really good for a lot until you see the reality and then hope for that that is unseen is a thing of the past for you my friend because you have seen then 
it's really almost a penalty. I'm, I'm not going to get on to that. Some of you will understand what I'm saying, and if you don't, don't worry about it. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans. All right? 13. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to worry men, but will ye worry my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, that king. It was written throughout the word that Jesus would come, that he would die on the cross. But he reiterates the whole message to those. Talk about patience. Let me ask you something. I mean, let's, let's get this right down where the rubber meets the road. Let's say that... Let's say that you had a child that just really got all messed up in life, all right? I mean really messed up. And you had worked 10 years getting a little old bitty nest egg set up over here, you know? Counting on kind of maybe leaning back on that a little bit and relaxing, maybe. And the kid really blows it. And you go in there and you've got to spend that whole nest egg. And the child says, Boy, I wouldn't have done that for you. You're a fool for, have done that to, for having done that for me because I'm going to do it again. I love life. So you see, when Jesus has just got through paying the price on the cross and they kind of forget about him when they're walking down the road, how would you feel about it? Hmm? Would you be happy? Would you have taken the time to start all over? From Genesis, the Word, the Living Word, could you have had that patience? I don't know. You'll have to answer that yourself. But I just want you to see where he's coming from, right down where his emotions, for he is very emotional, very much. His love is, that's, that, I think that is one reason that his love is such a pleasure. Is that it's not a fake love. It's real. And he shares that with you when it's just poured out upon you. When he dies for you on the cross and still has that kind of patience. Don't pick the snake. There's no choice, friend. It's silly to even think of one. Don't let doubt come into that 10% of yourself. Look at the dust. Look at the dirt. Look at the perversion. And pick yourself up. He loves you, and he is precious. On it goes. Let's see. What we've, been, we've been going here for a little bit, but I want to go. Let's go, to, let's go to Isaiah 40 while we're here real quickly. Isaiah 40. I just want to show you how easy it is to document this simple thing in the world, and there's not a person in the room that could not have done this same thing. By that I mean the simple message. Chapter 40, verse 9. O Zion, thou bringest good tidings. Get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Do you understand that that one in part still got to come to pass? Do you know what the young ones are? That's those that maybe are not even able to really know the Scripture well enough to make it on their own. He's going to pick you up. He's going to pack you the rest of the way. Even after having paid the price, he's going to see you make the trip. He's going to pick you up and carry you. You see, that's written of the second advent as well. When he returns as King of kings and Lord of lords, chief shepherd, he that leads, let him be your leader. He will never, I mean but never, let you down. That is written, and it shall come to pass. But again, I hate to, bring, I hate to keep bringing this up. You've got another choice. Yep, the dust, perversion. 
Satanism. It's called the world. It's called darkness. You've got a choice, friend. You don't have to come with us into the beautiful, pleasant, loving world of eternity. You know, have you ever had the feeling that we were all together once before at a certain battle and that we stood, you know, we didn't have any big deal there. Do you realize we're all going to be together yet again? That your house is going to be next to my house and my house next to yours and on we go. God's elect, the leaders of all the peoples. No, it's no step for a stepper. And you stepped it before. That's why sometimes that from you, that that when you meet one of God's elect, that you just can kind of run over, kind of run over, get excited. I don't think that it's a new thing, for there's nothing new under the sun. But beloved, you've got to control that 10%. And if you've got 20% there, you've got more problems yet. You might even need a little help, but I know somebody that can help you, all right? It's time to get it under control because, hey, what we're about to go into is something you don't want to miss. Not the dust, not the dirt, not the perversion, not hell, not the lake of fire. When he has love that just flows over even to today, well, could we really go on without stopping at Isaiah 53? I'm just, I keep saying, and these are just so beautiful, I can't quit. I just can't quit, all right? But this is what he was saying to them. He said, don't you remember? Don't you remember it was supposed to happen this way? Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report? Bless your hearts, praise God, you do today. You believe his report. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? It's to you. That's why you're so precious. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. He's got to come and be born like a little babe, a little tender baby, like we were anointing up here, as defenseless as can be, except those parents protected. And as a root out of the dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. He's silent and, and submissive. And when, he shall, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire of him. He's perfect, just absolutely perfect. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Bless your heart, you listen to me. I want to, I want to make, I'm going to charge you now. If you turn your back on him when Antichrist, that beautiful one, appears on this earth, you'll be doing worse than these that turned their back on him at the cross. Did you hear what I said? I charge you with it. To turn your back on him by giving the time of day to Antichrist other than witnessing against him as you're supposed to is denying the Holy Spirit and is the unforgivable sin, if you don't think that's more serious. Do you see how serious it really is? Yeah, you've got a choice. But there is no choice. Why would we take the wealth of the eternity and throw it in the gutter? No way. No way. Because you're one of his elect. But why did I make that statement then? Did it make me feel good to just take and throw the unforgivable sin on everybody's back at this beautiful moment? No. It's reality. And it's something you've got to be aware of because, you see, it kind of closes the gate to where there's only a crack about that far as far as a choice is concerned. We don't have a choice. We've got to talk to that 10%. We've got to open up to it. I'm talking about yourself with yourself. And you've got to say, listen, Buster, you better get your act together, or I know somebody that's liable to move in on your territory, all right? I may just move in and let the Lord come in there and straighten your little old case out. All right? Get tough with yourself. Because you don't want to be involved with anything that even resembles the unforgivable sin. All right, what, what verse was I? Three? Okay. Uh, four. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. God taking your sin on him on that cross. But he was wounded 
for our transgressions. He was perfect. They knew it. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Bless you. <laughs> Bless you. She's dealing with that 10% already. Right? <laughs> All right. Oh, the Lord's in control. <laughs> but, you see, do you understand why Jesus would say, you, you're a little bit slow. It, haven't you read it? It's, you know, in Moses' book all the way through. They're, they're just bubbling over telling the story, you know. I want to close in Malachi. I'm going to close her up right there. Don't you all get tired of me hear, hearing me say that I'm going to close here in just a minute. And I, I don't keep my word on that very good. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, I'm just going to start reading it. Behold, last chapter in the Old Testament, Malachi meaning my messenger in the Hebrew tongue. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may be able... About who may abide, rather, the day of his coming? Well, if you're going to be here, you're going to have to abide it. All right? That's reality again. And who shall stand when he appeareth? How many will already have bowed to Antichrist? All right? Do you understand how serious it is at this moment? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. That's lie, friend. He's going to do some scrubbing down. There's going to be some warm baths, all right? Hot, hot, hot. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. God's elector, he is so proud of them. Yep, they need a little cleaning up. They need a little polishing. But even though it's like fuller's soap, it does a good job. That's what he's talking about. It's shiny like metal that you pour lye on to cleanse it. Then and, and uh, silver and the Lord and offering in righteousness, then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. Do you know what that former years mean? Ancient, the time before. See, it's not the first time, but you've got to bring yourself to that point of realization. It's going to happen again. It's going to be soon. And you better be prepared. And I will... And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wage and so forth, the followless, the widow. <coughs> He's coming, and he likes those that are gentle with his people. He likes those that discipline the people. Never be afraid to stand bold, even though it may be found upon by certain in the Christian community to be strong in the word, for it doesn't do any good to soft pedal, because when you soft pedal, you come almost being akin to a false witness, all right? Because something as serious as somebody's soul is a very serious thing. We come to that time. Those are the words of Jesus Christ, his first teaching after the crucifixion. Did he stop just because he was crucified? No, he went back to the beginning. He started over. We have to start over and over and over. Many times we have questions from brand new people that I know that you've heard answered so many times. But you see, that's part of your ministry too, is feeding those tender sheep. Because as he promised even the young, those that are young in the word, he picks up and carries. Bless your heart, he expects you to too. That's what we're about in the first place, you understand? That's why we've got to have patience with them. If we lose that, well, we've really lost the Christ that is in us in large part. What a precious time to live. Yes, he caused those that walked with him on that road that day to not recognize him as he went back to Genesis and simply reiterated the scripture. I could turn around tomorrow or some other time and simply reiterate again the coming of Antichrist, Mark 13, Matthew 24. You all know them by the heart. 
Do not let them become a ritual of belief within your heart and mind. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean, you just cover it and think about it so much that, well, you kind of separate yourself from the reality of it as the reality approaches. No, we're not playing church. It is a reality, and as it's written, you're without excuse. It's going to come to pass. And you know what? We put up a heck of a battle the last time. I mean, it was a rough. The cabal, the heavens shook, the earth shook. Satan was pulled down from his throne, and we whomped it on him. We're going to do it again, all right? We can cut it. We're can-do type people because we have him, because we lean on him, because he gives us that power and that authority. We have some interesting days, months, and years approaching us as we see prophecy, as it rushes to its fulfillment. We'll be talking some more about that in the next lecture. Bless your hearts. Even as he thought of you walking up that hill this generation, so did he when he rose from the tomb, after having freed so many, started teaching all over again that you can count on his word. So you talk to your inner self, even as I talk to your inner, inner self. That's where your soul is. It's good for that to happen to you occasionally. You never know when you might be tucking a lot of little things aside down there and say, well, I'll deal with it, you know. Just me, I'll, I'll deal with it later. No, let's, let's keep it, let's keep it stirred up, even if it's still there, let's don't let it get comfortable, all right? Let's keep dealing with it. You do yours and I'll do mine, okay? Let's don't jump on each other's case, all right? Just deal with yourself and keep your faith strong and let his word be a reality in your heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the written word. Thank you for this word, Father. We thank you for being with us this day and we ask that you be with us uh, tomorrow, Father. As we have set this day aside, to remember you in that time that you paid the price for us. We ask it in Jesus' precious name.